the fourth panel of the CSD conference 2021, Climate Change and Conflict, Unequal Realities at the Forefront. My name is Gizem Mirtseven, and I'm a master's student in Conflict, Security and Development in the War Studies Department. I also have a bachelor's degree in international relations from the University of Geneva. My research interests uh, lie in peacekeeping, and peace building, as well as power sharing in post-conflict societies. And of course, the link between climate change and conflict. I have the pleasure to moderate this wonderful panel today in which we will discuss the link between climate change and conflict, as well as inequality. This relationship has been highly debated among researchers and policymakers alike. At times, it has led to an oversimplification of potential conflict causes by the media and others. The extent to which inequality of climate change impacts uh, plays a role in exacerbating existing, inequality, existing conflicts or possibly lead to future conflicts will be a central topic of discussion today. And before I introduce the wonderful panelists that we have on board today, I would like to remind everyone that the session is being recorded and will be shared after the conference. You can interact with the conference through our social media by using the hashtag CSDC2021. I'd like to ask the audience to think of questions to ask our panelists, and you don't have to wait um, until the end, but can ask them in the Q&A box as we go. The questions will be answered after uh, the panelists' initial comments. Now, our first panelist is uh, Janani Vivekananda. Janani is the head of climate security and diplomacy at Adelphi, where she leads research and programming on climate change, peace building, and security. With over 15 years of experience on these issues, with a particular focus on South Asia and Africa, her interests lie in understanding the complexities of climate change and conflict related risks on a local level and feeding these into policy work. She is widely published, as well as being a lead author of the 2015 flagship report, A New Climate for Peace, and the co-author of the seminal 2007 study, A Climate of Conflict, The Links Between Climate Change, Peace and War. Our second speaker, <coughs> excuse me, our second speaker is Professor Jeff Dabelko who is Professor and Associate Dean in the Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs at Ohio University. He's a Senior Advisor to the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center, where he was Director until 2012. His current research focuses on environmental peace building and the conflict potential of climate change mitigation and adaptation. He is a lead author of the Human Security Chapter in the IPCC's fifth assessment and is a member of the UN Environment Programs Expert Advisory Group on Environment, Conflict and Peace Building. He is also widely published and has co-edited the book Environmental Peacemaking and Green Planet Blues, Critical Perspectives on Global Environmental Politics. Our third panelist is Dr. Aisha Siddiqui who's a lecturer at the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge. Her research focuses on disasters in post-colonial contexts in conflict affected areas. She has worked for the International Development Select Committee at the UK's Houses of Parliament. She published for the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction and for various think tanks, such as the Overseas Development Institute. Her book, in the wake of disasters, Islamists, the state and the social contract in Pakistan was published in 2019. Most recently, she's examined flooding in Pakistan, typhoons in the Philippines and floods and landslides in Colombia. Last but certainly not least, we have Catherine Mung on board. She is a policy specialist for climate and security risk with UNDP's conflict prevention and climate change teams and UNDP's focal point for UN climate security mechanism. She has served in various capacities with the UN on climate change, natural resources and environmental sustainability at both headquarters and in the field. 
I'm very excited to hear all your thoughts on the central theme of inequality in relation to climate change and conflict in your initial remarks. And before we open up to a discussion and answer questions from the audience. So without further ado, let's start with Janani. Thanks so much, Gizem. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be part of this, um, such a great panel and, and this really great uh, seminar. Um, so in my seven minutes, I'd like to address the question of why it's so important that we understand inequality as a central theme of climate change and conflict. And based on this understanding, what we can actually do to better address inequality in our responses to climate security risks. So climate change impacts are felt by everyone but they're not felt by everyone equally. These impacts, things like uh, drought, more intense rainfall and storms, uh, soil erosion and the degradation of the marine environment, these kind of biophysical impacts can lead to human impacts, things like famine, loss of land, loss of livelihoods, and things like cultural gender norms and power dynamics between different, uh, different identity groups shape how women, men, boys and girls of different socioeconomic, religious, political backgrounds experience and can cope with these climate impacts in different ways. And we can see that based on these capacities, due in part to these cultural norms, the assets that different people, different groups have available, their social networks, the power dynamics that they're subject to, based on these, we can see that these that climate impacts have disproportionate impacts on certain groups over others specifically on the elderly, women and girls, the poor, vulnerable and already marginalized populations. So there's growing evidence to support this, that poorer countries or um, indeed indiv individuals are more negatively affected by climate change, either because they lack the resources to be able to adapt. Uh, for example, they can't afford household insurance or they, they, they just can't um, jump in a car and move as, as you might be able to if you, if you had some assets, uh, or because they tend to live in uh, more fragile and climate vulnerable region, region, uh, regions, more kind of structural causes, um, in, in these kind of places where additional warming can be detrimental to both their pr productivity and also to stability. Now, this is happening in the context of global inequality, at least between countries, actually decreasing over the past few decades, uh, not counting COVID effects. I guess this is changing things somewhat. But if we look at the trend over the past few decades, global inequality is decreasing, particularly due to the rapid economic growth of places like uh, India and China. But climate change is reversing that trend. And this is not just something that's happening only now or is is um projected for the future there's evidence that this has been happening since the 1960s so we're kind of um we we're, we're locked into something that we really need to proactively shift out of so essentially we have at a, a, a situation where at individual community and nat national level um climate change compounds and is looking to lock in pre-existing inequalities now many of these contexts most affected by climate change are also already experiencing fragility and conflict in part because of uh, factors linked to inequality things like political exclusion marginalization and inequitable power structures to put it in numbers um over 70 percent of the most climate vulnerable countries are on the list of most fragile states and these climate impacts that i've just set out through various pathways including by compounding inequalities can increase the risks to peace and security potentially exacerbating societal and state fragility and fueling conflict people in these contexts that are thus facing this double vulnerability of climate change and conflict now this means that any efforts to address climate change and climate related security risks need to be based on a thorough understanding of how inequality, security and climate risks come together, how they're inextricably linked. This means looking at or taking an intersectional approach, understanding how different people are affected differently. Gender is a part of this, but it's critical to understand gender in terms of a kind of a broader meaningful intersectional approach uh, looking at not just women but men women boys and girls and in the context of various other markers such as age religion and background because simply having um, a gendered lens 
as as this narrow as women really does miss miss some of the the complexity in northern nigeria for example norms of masculinity such as the male perceived male need to protect family wealth and the need for men to pay a or young men boys to pay a bride price in order to get married thereby being able to progress from boyhood to manhood these as as um, these these abilities are, are being stressed by uh, climate impacts uh, compounding people's uh, livelihood and security, this is in intensifying intercommunal conflicts between different identity groups between farmers and pastoralists, etc, and motivating young men to join armed groups such as uh, Boko Haram, uh, which offer um, loans. So that um, so that these kind of norms of masculinity can be met in the face of uh, climate stresses. Uh, in Chad, another example, everyday violence against women and girls creates economic stress and really undermines households and communities' capacities to adapt to environmental change. And this uh, and the economic insecurity um, that people are facing, exacerbated by climate change, since most people's livelihoods are tied to the natural environment, to rainfall, um, or natural resources such as land. Th this is making young girls more vulnerable to early marriage, and young women more likely to enlist in also joining armed groups. It also drives male migration within and outside the region, which is also exposing young men to greater risk. So it's really important to understand the implications of these things in a really intersectional approach and by not looking at the differential ways in which different people are affected differently that is to say by not taking this intersectional approach to climate security analysis we really run the risk of potentially entrenching pre-existing inequitable norms around gender and other ethno-religious markers and i think this is something you might hear more about from my esteemed colleague jeff uh jeff de balco in his input so why is this so important? Well, because the goals of peace, climate action and equality are not just interlinked, they're mutually reinforcing. Understanding gender in these broader intersectional dimensions um, of climate re related security risks are not only key to avoiding the exacerbation of vulnerabilities and increasing the risks of violence, but also to kind of identifying new entry points for ad advancing equality, gender equality, um, improving climate resilience and also sustaining peace. So if that's uh, what we need to do, well, how, what do we actually, uh, how do we go about this? Um, we need to to take action we need to, we need the steps and tools to be able to ensure that climate action is conflict and uh gender sensitive or, or is able to take this um inclusive intersectional approach and, and if we can do this then we can uh support policy makers development practitioners and donors to um ensure that their investments do no harm by existing uh um uh, reliance uh to climate um or to, to ensure that um, climate uh, security risk responses have impact and that they're actually sustainable in the face of climate change. The first step towards this is um, an integrated climate security analysis approach, like applying a, a lens or an a, uh, analytical approach that helps us understand uh, all these interdimensional risks. It essentially means taking a 360 degree look at the, the issue. So climate impacts, they're not taking place in a vacuum. They occur against this backdrop of pre-existing uh, dimensions of, of inequality, of societal, political, economic um, stresses. And so we need uh, an approach that helps us understand those and understand these power dynamics, gender dynamics and societal norms. Uh, that uh, are the kind of structural drivers of inequality and understand how these then interact with climate uh, and insecurity. So this means uh, two things. One, we have to really understand the broader context in which these climate risks play out, the climate security risks play out. And the second is we need to understand this interaction between uh, climate change and these contextual factors. And just to, to end, the three things we really need to note here is when we do this, when we try to operationalize this, it's important that this has to happen at the most local level possible by local experts at the uh, within the communities uh, we're looking at. Um, we also need to analyze the interactions, not just overlay kind of inequality and climate and conflict on top of each other and see where they coincide, 
it makes nice maps, but it doesn't tell us anything about the whys and what we then need to do to respond or what communities can do to respond. We need to, um, to look at who is affected and how. Um, and so move beyond the, uh, the where and how many questions. And the third thing is we need to not just look at the past, we also need to be able to do this in a forward-looking way. And this is where we really need to be able to bring in um, climate impact data. We need to look at um, climate models and scenarios to help us uh, see what the future looks like because climate impacts are happening so quickly that the, the future just isn't a good enough indicator of the past. So we need to better include um, kind of climate models to help us better, to help better inform um, uh, policies and processes around uh, inequality and peace and security programming. So it's clear that the impacts of climate change have a broad range of impacts on peace and security. It's also clear that these impacts fall across all different sectoral mandates. This means um, it's relevant not just for climate change actors, not just for peace and security actors, it's also something for development and humanitarian and foreign policy and defence actors. Um, and I think there's scope for all of these sectors within their remits to do something towards enhancing kind of um, uh, better acknowledgement of inequality within climate security uh, risk analysis and programming. Uh, and I think with better awareness and better analysis uh, within each sector, um, we can hopefully move away from uh, siloed thinking and also get move towards this um, more kind of systematic uh, approach to to this um, integrated risk assessment approach. I'll leave it there and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shalini. That was a wonderful introduction to the topic. And uh, we'll move to Jeff next. Terrific. Well, it was indeed an excellent presentation as John and his uh, presentations always are. So it's a delight to be um, following her, although always a, a tough act to follow. But in many respects, I'll, I'll take a piece of, of what uh, John and he raised and, and focus on uh, a, a particular dimension that ties into quite directly the justice considerations that um, the organizers are to be applauded uh, for having um, that heavy emphasis on inequality and justice. I can say as somebody who's been at this topic for quite a while, um, whether it's climate security or broader environment security, that hasn't always been the case. And that has been a, a neglected area, um, I think, to the detriment, obviously, of the, uh, the people who are uh, on the on the losing side of that, but to the field and making the progress that we need to make. And so it's critically important that it's part of the discussion uh, as it is. Um, and in fact, I think, you know, uh, maybe because I have been at it for a while on this topic, I'd like to kind of remind myself and remind others that um, when we started in earnest after the Cold War ended in the early 90s, environment security really didn't have space for climate change as part of this climate and security discussion. Uh, it was seen as too long term, too diffuse, didn't raise, uh, didn't kind of contribute directly to dynamics that raised to uh, the level of conflict that was the focus. So it was kind of pushed to the, pushed to the side. Uh, part of the problem then, and arguably now, is that our definition of conflict was, was very narrow and in some cases continues to be narrow, um, focused on really important topics, but have heavily still on the intentionality, the large, um, large organized forces engaging, death at the end of a gun, lots of battle deaths on a traditional battlefield. And you know, that I think comes with some of the biases of political science and international relations. It has a lot of people focusing on this. That's what we have studied historically, um, but it really misses um, uh, the much wider agenda that this uh, demands, these topics demand. Um, and it kind of with that focus on the, the higher levels of violence, more organized types of violence, it really uh, 
missed the larger human security considerations, the smaller sea conflict questions that weren't necessarily as organized, didn't necessarily have the big battle deaths that are easy to count, sometimes could be hugely impactful with the killing of one, where we're now spending more time, I think, wisely understanding that environmental defenders and the targeted assassination of individuals is part of this discussion that has historically not been and is, is uh, kind of on us for not having prioritized um, those folks who are often standing up to much more powerful actors. So this climate conflict peace building is much more than that narrow construction, but that history I think is important to know where we need to go, where we've been and what we haven't done. But so 06, 07 climate really became the environment security discussion, sometimes maybe to even the exclusion of some of those environment, natural resource and conflict. I think we're we, we need to walk and chew gum at the same time and understand that it's not just one or the other. In fact, they're inextricably linked when we bring climate change down to specific places. Um, but I wanted to flag um, a, a piece of what Janani laid out, these backdraft dynamics that probably about 10 years ago, uh, quite a, a number of folks started adding, I'd say, to the climate security discussion and saying, you know, this initial focus on what uh, the climate dynamics are, or yeah, the climate dynamics are, and the immediate responses, say displacement of people, the, those kind of immediate knock on effects of those climate impacts, how they might factor into conflict. There was a lot of attention there. Um, but there wasn't a lot of attention, if any, uh, being paid to how, uh, when we do respond to climate through mitigation, through adaptation, how those actions could themselves create new conflicts or factor into existing lines of tension. And so these backdraft dynamics were ones that um, in some ways then and still now, uh, you could classify as in part a deductive argument where the evidence base is not where you'd like it to be, in part because we haven't been very serious about responding to climate change, right? We haven't been um, tremendously aggressive on mitigating um, uh, climate or certainly uh, the kind of delayed response in uh, adapting to it. And so in that respect, we have some areas of this kind of um, set of questions that where we do have some evidence and others where it's um, again back to why it's important to pay attention to our history of environment conservation natural resource management peace and conflict that we have some analogous histories that weren't driven first and foremost under a cli climate frame but um, are some of the same dynamics that show us that these can be done well or they can be done poorly and if they're done poorly then they can lead to um, a conflict context and certainly a, a question of of justice so with the with the, um, with the hope of helping our practitioners our, um, from the top down and the bottom up, so to speak, going into these big, big changes that come with uh, a, a transition away from carbon, um, go in with our eyes open and understand that there will be winners and losers. Um, it won't just all be winners if, we, if and when we make this transition. Um, but we need to do it in ways that reduces conflict that it could potentially create. And in part, we do that by maximizing um, the justice and uh, making that a just transition as well as a peaceful transition. A few examples um, in, in um, a kind of our, our opening set of um, interventions. Uh, you know, it's very encouraging that the price of solar is going down, but it requires lots of land. These aren't empty places that the solar is going to and is occupying. And we know again from analogous, you know, there's plenty of <laughs> history is replete with conflict over land and competing uses for it, right? So why should we think that that will be immune to some of those dynamics? Again, we, um, it's very promising. It's the directions we need to move in terms of um, renewable energy, but let's do it understanding that these are challenges. Solar, wind, EVs, they all still all have plenty of um, mineral inputs, dirty mineral inputs that have a host of justice issues surrounding their extraction and, 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 and processing. So we need to, again, know that those um, inputs, just like the fossil fuel based economy has all sorts of those point of extraction, uh, environmental and social injustices and um, really damaging situations. So too will we in this green transition. 
Um, biofuels, we do have evidence where, do have some cases where trying to do right by diversifying uh, transportation fuel sources and moving on to renewables has a heavy cost in the kind of alternative use of that land um, for food, for the kind of land tenure, deforestation, particularly of, of kind of rich um, um, tropical forests and such. So these are ones, again, where these unintended effects of trying to do right by climate have to be part of this discussion, because if they don't, um, they, we've seen that they'll be uh, problematic in, in ways that really are central to questions of conflict and justice. Hydropower, large infrastructure displaces millions of people, important um, kind of alternative to the end of the gun in terms of, of why these things are still important. And it may be, as we've seen, some of the most prominent environmental defenders who have been killed by the end of the gun uh, have, been, have been protesting large water infrastructure projects. And so that's something that we, again, want to make these transitions away from fossil fuels, but have to understand that on the mitigation side, there are all sorts of sorts of issues. I would add one more on the mitigation side, the, the red plus schemes, I mean, tremendously powerful tool, payment for ecosystem services, putting value on forests as a sequestration. At the same time, it's about changing access to resources and money. So it can be done well, and it can be done poorly. And the governance variable there is the one to really, um, and participation and kind of taking a justice lens on, on how those can make sure um, all are benefiting from that approach and not just uh, differentially. On the adaptation, uh, adaptation for whom we had a lot of conversation about just transition. I think this fits well within that. Wealthy can adapt, but at the expense of the poor in many instances. And we need to understand this as part of our climate and security discussion. I would even say dynamics like uh, land grabbing could be perceived as a rational adaptation or maladaptation um, to dynamics associated with climate change if you're water poor but wealthy. And um, in that sense, a really pernicious form of maladaptation because it's rife with local injustice in terms of uh, whose land for producing food for whom. So flagging these kinds of examples where again, where some cases we have evidence and some cases it's, a, it's more of a deductive argument, but we're doing that not to make it more difficult to make a transition. And it's certainly been something I've been asked when I um, kind of raise these uh, un, un, unwelcome uh, considerations, um, trying, not trying to make it harder to uh, make the make the necessary transitions around climate. Um, but raising these questions about the potential pitfalls of doing it so that we can minimize the conflict and try to maximize the justice um, in, in navigating it. And so um, I think it's really important to be clear about the necessity of making these changes, uh, but they're ones that are really big and transformative changes. And so um, understanding them in this conflict and justice is critically important for those who are coming at it from the conflict and peace building side and those coming at it from the climate and natural resources and conservation side. So in all of these, the focus on justice needs to be front and center. It hasn't historically. And so it's very positive that um, we're talking about it so centrally today. Thank you very much, Professor Jeff, for um, providing these fascinating insights on backtracked effects which, uh, in my opinion, are, you know, way talked about not, not much at all. And I think even in terms of um, when we talk about inequalities of climate change adaptation, I think these uh, secondary effects that, that you're focusing um, on, they are often forgotten or not even, it's, it's not even an afterthought. It's not even a thought at all, <laughs> which, uh, which surely we'll talk about some more in the Q&A. Ayesha, next up. Hi, can you hear me all right? Um, so uh, thank you very much for having me um, on this panel. It's a pleasure to be here. And this I think um, it's really important um, before I start for me to kind of situate my research within um, the disciplinary and the academic context within I work within which I, I work. So I'm a geographer and I do ethnographic research in um, 
communities that have been affected by hazard-based disasters, like you mentioned, like floods, typhoons, landslides, etc. And um, in these communities where I'm working, people are also often living with underlying issues of insecurity, which could include political conflict or militancy. Um, and through field work and engaging with people on the ground, I try and understand the ways in which extreme weather events and hazards are impacting um, issues around uh, security and conflict. And I think that um, hopefully this background provides somewhat of an understanding of my more critical perspective on this topic. So what my research has shown is that um, in the kind of extreme weather events and hazards that I've been um, studying, they do sometimes result um, in, in, in conflict, but not necessarily in the ways we, we think most obvious and, and most evident. Um, in the last decade or so that I've been engaged uh, with this issue, I've seen some kind of, um, of conflict, uh, but that's primarily because of the policies that are being implemented to build resilience in communities to human-induced um, climate change. So vulnerable communities in the global in most parts of the world um, that I've been looking at are being told that extreme weather events related to climate change are going to make their farm so dangerous. And for this reason, they're being evicted from their homes in cities uh, like Karachi and Pakistan so that city authorities can implement better flood risk planning. And indigenous communities in rural Colombia are being displaced so that large can make even renewable energy. And these and they are resisting the state and the institutions and whoever else um, because basically people are telling them that they are being dispossessed now so that climate change doesn't dispossess them in the future and that obviously to them makes makes no, no sense in my work what i haven't seen so far is the kind of local level or regional level fighting between different groups over more water or more food that often gets kind of, of, of talked about so in my perspective uh, where and how we need to reorientate this discussion or this narrative um, is that firstly, we need to get a far better and a far deeper understanding of what makes people more vulnerable or more susceptible to extreme weather events. And this is often, as we've heard um, other speakers of this panel say, this is a fairly kind of multi-tiered and complex set of factors. So for example, we know that local, regional, even national governments really like relocating people and they often do it quite forcefully because these people are supposedly living in um, areas that are considered high risk or high hazard or whatever. And while this may seem like a fairly kind of straightforward solution to this main problem of extreme weather event, but actually social researchers far more accomplished and, and, and better than me at this work have shown that such interventions are really quite problematic because instead of reducing people's vulnerability and increasing their resilience, when you remove people from the social networks and the kinship networks that they are part of, this actually drastically reduces their vulnerability and their ability to be able to cope with extreme uh, 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 hazards or extreme climate events. And the second thing that we really need to do much better is we need to get a much better understanding of the way in which a climate or a weather related disaster is not really an event. It's a far kind of longer term social process and it's rooted within this history of colonial exploitation post-colonial state building and neoliberal expansion. Because when you see the story of vulnerability of indigenous people, for example, it doesn't really begin with the most recent environmental or, or uh, climate related hazard, but it goes back quite a few hundred years, say to the, the, the European imperial expansion and the implementation of alien land management policies so that they can better control um, these autonomous areas. And so within that kind of historically rooted temporal understanding, climate stops being, um, or rather not, not climate, but, but people who are resisting that kind of exploitation, they stop being just insurgents or just rebels or whatever, and they become uh, just one more form of resistance to this kind of wider um, uh, forms of exploitation and, and uh, expansion taking place in, 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 in these regions. So there are, there are very um, evident ways where when you begin to um, root this, um, the, the, the climate event within that broader history, actually you see that that very direct link between climate and conflict breaks. It's a, it's a much um, uh, history of, 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 of social processes and um, uh, exploitation. 
And the last point that I want to make, because I think it's really, um, it's really such an important one, is that, of course, there is a policy bias towards um, having this as a very urgent, very simplistic, and often even um, alarmist account of, of, of climate directly linked to conflict in, in these kinds of ways. And of course, um, we can understand why there is that kind of bias because it ena enables a certain kind of securitization to take place and for um, a particular kinds of interventions to, um, to be implemented. But I see my job as a social researcher um, as one that, that challenges that narrative and that, um, that, that kind of picks apart some of the complexities um, that uh, we don't really do justice to when we, when we try and go those kinds of Thank you so much, Aisha, for providing this um, this historical background and this reinsertion of climate change and climate change resilience in into the wider historical and uh, and, and social context. I think that's very important to understand uh, the link between these inequalities and uh, and climate change and conflict. Now, last but not least, Catherine, please. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Kizem, and a big thank you to the organisers for. Um, putting together this uh, session. It's um, a pleasure to have the chance to share some insights um, and a perspective from the UN and, and UNDP um, in particular, and also share the panel um, with Janani, uh, Jeff, and um, Aisha as well. Um, I think there's been a lot of discussion recently um, on the triple threat of climate change, nature loss, and pollution. And as the other speakers have already um, mentioned just now as well, we are obviously not just talking about um, matters of an environmental nature. Um, and I think the emphasis here on equality um, is important, particularly uh, with the compounding effects um, on equality and then uh, of, the, of these phenomena themselves, but then also how we respond to them. Um, if we look at the, the work, for example, of the Intergovernmental Panel, uh, Intergovernmental Science and Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, that the, the 2018 report showed that land degradation is intimately linked and undermining the well-being of two-fifths of humanity that land degradation is responsible for, for about 10% of anthropogenic GHG emissions and um, has the potential to reduce crop yields by um, up to 50% um, in some regions by 2050. With, uh, and we can imagine here and try to, and, and need to better understand these, the kind of impacts looking forward, as Jani said, um, on livelihoods, on human mobility, and also underlying drivers of fragility and, and conflict. And, the, the, the same, same report um, also um, emphasizes the benefits of land re restoration here um, and uh, being kind of 10 times um, um, what, what we would have invest, what the cost would be um, when comparing nine, nine different bio biomes. So I think this is, um, this, is, this is probably kind of the main focus of my intervention here as well, to stress the importance of conflict sensitive and, and peace positive uh, climate action and, and that um, you know, the, the gaps that are there in terms of the research in how, how we go about this and how, how these concepts are operationalized. And, um, you know, myself coming from uh, the, the climate change field, having worked on mitigation adaptation, but also more broadly on environmental sustainability. Um, over the years, we have endeavored to climate proof every sector, um, agriculture, um, urban planning, transport, and so forth. And the peace and security sector really is somewhat of the final frontier, if you like. The, the, it is a blind spot for us. There, there isn't guidance out there on how to climate proof um, um, prevention and, and sustaining peace. But uh, in recent years, we have seen an increased understanding um, as other speakers have mentioned already um, that uh, climate change is a matter for peace and security actors. Um, the Security Council has been, I think, an important reference point for us um, in terms of its resolutions and mandates um, within the UN system relating to various different contexts, including Lake Chad Basin, uh, Mali, Somalia, um, and Darfur, among others as well. We also have other reference points in terms of the work of the EU um, and um, the African Union com com uh, Commission, in, in addition to all the um, incredible research and, and literature that, that is out there, and the tremendous contributions of, of experts such as um, such such as such as Jeff and Aisha and, and Janani, among others as well. Um, I'd just like to take the opportunity to say a couple of words about the, the work that we're doing um, in this space as the UN, and then some thoughts on the on, on the topic as well. Um, and as mentioned just now, that within the UN system, there has, has lacked a kind of systematic approach to addressing climate related security risks and the creation of the climate security mechanism in 2018 I think has been somewhat a step in the right direction to help better institutionalize analysis and response to climate related security risks um, and in this regard 
UNDP is working with DPPA, uh, UNEP and UNEP and more than 20 other UN partners under the community of practice that we have established to ensure that policy um, is being informed, um, as Janani mentioned uh, at the beginning as well, by integrated analysis and assessment and uh, to try to uh, endeavor to consolidate the evidence base of management and response strategies and promote um, early warning for enhanced response. Um, as a climate security mechanism, we are, we are working on diff different tracks. So the PPA leads in terms of political an analysis um, and its role in kind of backstopping the work of the special polit political missions and peace operations. UNEP, I think, brings to bear its expertise in environmental data and analytics and uh, UNDP um, its presence on the ground as the largest implementer of both climate action and uh, prevention and, 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 and peace building. Um, two, year, two and a half years on now, we, we are, are implementing pilots um, in various different locations, in, in nine locations in three regions, so Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and also the, the Arab states. And this includes support to three special political missions, so the Office of the Special Envoy of the Horn of Africa, uh, the UN Office of Central um, Africa as well, and the UN Office of West Africa and the Sahel. We're also providing support to um, global self um, actors, to regional entities, including the League of Arab States and the Liptap Gorm Authority to help them develop um, their own uh, vision and um, strategies uh, and, and, and action plans to address climate related security risks. And at the same time, trying to add um, a lens um, on climate security to local level um, peace building um, and stabilization efforts um, in, in two countries, in, in, in Somalia and, and Sudan, uh, respectively. I mean, in terms of the, the framing questions for today's uh, session and the discourse on, on climate security, um, I think it's clear, clear um, as has been mentioned in this session already, that we are talking about um, something uh, about issues which are um, and, and questions uh, fundamentally of political, existential and human security. Um, and that um, we, we do need to address climate change um, as a matter of international uh, peace and security to be able to in ad address inequality too as well. So I have five, five points to, to make in, in this regard and I'll jump into them quickly as, as uh, with the um, time constraints that we have today. And the first one that, the first point that I would like to make, which kind of picks up on Jeff's point as well, is the, the focus so far that has been um, of, of the research agenda on causality um, and uh, climate change in terms of its impacts on peace um, and security. Whereas I think we we understand in terms of the, the, the broad-based consensus that, uh, that, that climate change is important and the imperative is already there um, in terms of the risk multiplier effects that it has on peace and security. But often in the debate and in the research, we um, neglect to, to better understand the contribution of climate action to peace, stability and security, and that the technical solutions to adaptation, but also access to energy offered by climate change can often be easier entry points uh, for building peace and, and mending social fabric. And um, I think a lot more needs to be done in terms of the, the metrics to try to understand these co-benefits. And this really does require, um, as Shanali mentioned just now, a kind of practice orientation and a focus on the grassroots, because if we can work out what's working, what we are doing in terms of climate change, adaptation and mitigation, that isn't, it's not only not causing conflict, but also contributing to peace. We can do it better. We can do it systematically, um, and we can encourage learning, um, and we can do it by design and not not ad, and not ad hoc. And I think um, there's uh, there's a growing body of work out there on peace, positive adaptation and mitigation that is kind of interesting for us again as field actors and and, and working um, with some of the communities um, most affected by the dual burden of climate and conflict. And to, to my uh, second point, um, adaptation and maladapt adaptation comes up frequently. Um, in, the research, in the research that, that, that does address um, such issues. But access to energy is often um, neglected as well. And when we think about renewable energy solutions um, and the opportunities that they present to diversify um, and reduce competition for livelihoods and coping strategies, um, including areas receiving IDPs and refugees, um, I, you know, I would say that de decentralized access to energy in conflict affected um, adverse and fragile contexts um, that renewables afford really is a lifeline that makes all kinds of other supports possible, including access to clean water, light, warmth, sustenance, as well as basic and emergency services. Um, and if we're choosing renewables, if we're choosing clean technologies and reconstruction efforts, uh, we strengthen resilience and we avoid uh, more costlier efforts to come back and retrofit at a, a, a later stage. I and mean, obviously, as Jeff mentioned just now, you know, we can't talk about en energy as well without talking about um, and addressing just transition at, at the same time. Um, Quickly to my third point, um, the reverse linkage, I think, is often 
um, overlooked and important to um, addressing inequality as well, as well. Climate impacts on um, drivers of conflict and in insecurity. Conflict and insecurity also impact on climate. Um, and the countries which are, are, are grappling with violent and, and armed conflict, they will possess reduced capacity for institutional capacity um, and resources to elaborate and implement uh, climate policies, including national, the nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans. And the same could be said for COVID, but conflict um, is different in that it also leads to the physical destruction of strategic assets, so renewable energy, facilities, but also other kinds of energy installations and tourism related infrastructure and productive capacities, thereby impairing um, green growth um, and resilient recovery. Um, conflict at the same time also implies the need to protect water points, agriculture and key infrastructure. I think this is something that really comes across in terms of UNDP's study and typology of climate related security risks. Um, in the first round 186 con uh, nationally determined contributions under the, the Paris Agreement. Um, to my fourth point, a lot of work on climate security somehow still focuses on, um, on, the, on, on the UN um, and regional entities. And I think there's a, a missed opportunity in terms of the focus on global climate governance. Not only the, in, in the international negotiations themselves, which are really complex, but the kind of entry points that global climate governance creates, the amount of data that is generated through these processes, the finance that is tied to them. And again, this is a question of, of, of access as well as well inequality and the broad momentum around the, the climate change agenda, which we can see um, from various movements, including the Extinction Rebellion and of late can be, and the youth movement um, overall can be an incredible um, driving force that we can harness here um, in, terms of in terms of action in addressing climate related security risks. And when we're talking about equality and inequality of access, the, the, the question of climate fi finance is also um, important here. Um, as, as Janani mentioned at the beginning, if you're looking at countries that are most affected by climate, ICRC, for example, estimates that, that the 20 countries most affected by climate, 12 of those also suffer conflict. Um, and if you cross-reference it against other data out there, and, and we still have to do that because a lot of the data kind of on climate finance and conflict affected and fragile states is still somewhat anecdotal. But if you look, for example, at the work of um, the Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance, it shows that countries most vulnerable to climate change um, receive on average about $20 per person per year um, in, cli climate, in climate finance. So we are seeing higher intersectional risks, um, specific populations uh, often affected by conflicts and insecurity, which are underserved and um, a need to um, ensure better access to um, climate finance and, uh, and to, to better understand the contribution of climate finance to sustaining peace and, and to also mainstream considerations um, of peace and security um, in, into climate, which is something that we're kind of also working on um, at the moment um, as UNDP and together with um, CSM. So um, just thanks so much again for the invitation and I'll, I'll stop here and head over back to Gizm. Thank you very much, Catherine, for uh, your fascinating points. Um, I think all of the interventions link very well together and we've all talked about um, issues of structural inequalities and, and, and how, um, how they need to be addressed. So I have a first question before we uh, kick off the Q&A to um, all our panelists. And my question would be, so also often um, those who are shaping climate action as well as uh, mitigation policies, they are the ones perpetuating uh, these structural inequalities, which might or might not um, contribute to conflict as well. So how, um, can we convince governments and these multilateral organizations to, to attune their responses to uh, these differential impacts on, on, um, on, uh, on, on the people who are, who are suffering from uh, climate change? Anyone can go first. Tonani, maybe you wanna go first? Uh, sorry, Aisha, uh, Gizem, could you just repeat the start of the question? Uh, my sound just cut out for a second. Yes, no, I just said that uh, those who are shaping climate action and mitigation policies, they're often the ones who are perpetuating these inequalities. And, and, and how can we make sure from the bottom up to convince those governments and, and, and uh, multilateral organizations to attune their responses to um, these differential impacts? 
Um, thanks. It's a great question. I, I, I am afraid I'm quite cynical. I think um, at the at the kind of climate negotiations level, it's it's a very complicated dance, and um, the 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 pushing on these equity, climate justice, loss and damage issues is is seen as really really distracting and uh, kind of a, an obstacle to get others um others on board on the kind of on the broader kind of mitigation commitments um and climate finance so it's it's I, it's not going to happen through goodwill um at the at the policy level it's going to happen because it makes business sense it's going to happen because you know um big investment companies can see that it's no longer sustainable to invest you know pension funds in in uh, fossil fuel um based um companies anymore and then it's up to kind of um where when the the market forces push us this way i think then it's up to the policy and research community and the kind of the development community the practitioner community to then add the nuance to ensure that the way when we get to the agreements the way in which they're implemented and the way that they're nuanced is then um uh taking account of these kind of the, these differential uh risks ensuring that there's no backdrafts that they're, they're they're taking account of the unintended consequences I, I, um that side of things it's um it, it it's a, it's kind of it's depressing but i i it's just anybody that's in the negotiations sees it it's really not about um uh you know our children's children's future it's about you know um it's it's just kind of what what cards are on the table and what can you do to ensure that china and india don't pull out of the negotiations what do you do to keep russia in the game um so i think uh it's a it's a very complicated dance maybe others can be a bit more optimistic uh would anyone else like to yeah jeff you want to go well, I, I would just, um, I'll take up John and Nee's challenge to be uh, more optimistic. I certainly could um, subscribe to her perspective because I think it's a sound analysis, but I think some of the things that are happening are the way toward addressing the problem. It's not going to be quick, easy, or always successful, but certainly I think there's opportunity in the alignment of great interests and in energy behind um climate justice as well as social justice racial justice identity these kind of intersecting um issues that sometimes are seen together sometimes are seen at odds but increasingly i think are productively brought together around kind of power and access and winners and losers and um voice in the system and voice in governance structures that um that it's it is very much an uphill climb as john and he said but that um there are um, there's potential for momentum if we can um, harness that energy in ways that are cognizant of those realities in terms of negotiations and um, and the kind of the both tactics and strategy that John and he pointed out um, and at the same time come with the legitimacy that comes with the voice and justice perspective and so that is the increased activity of young people that's increased activity of um, indigenous peoples that's uh, you know the, the the in in um, so many places these are the frontline debates and finding a way to bring those into this discussion i think um can uh, will be viewed as complicating it and distracting and delaying a necessary change but just like the backdraft argument if you don't kind of if you don't have everyone in on the takeoffs they're not going to be there for the landings it's not going to work right so ultimately part of what the costs of not including those voices need to be made more clear and more obvious to those making those decisions who historically have marginalized them and been able to kind of tolerate the tolerate the the blowback or treat them as externalities that they don't have to take consideration of and if i could um also jump in i i think that i'm going to add that i'm a cynic from a slightly different perspective because i don't see a solution to what the, the kinds of um 
structural issues that we're talking about come from within the market-based system. So I think there, there, is, there are definitely moves to kind of challenge the way that we um, look at things like distribution of resources. I, I, I saw in the, in the Q and A uh, box there was a question on deep growth, and I, and I know that that there are all these different movements that are that are looking to challenge the way we understand um, our relationship to the environment and trying to come up with more sensible ways of, of marketizing that, putting a more accurate and more correct value on 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 um, different resources, including carbon. I just I just don't see that the the uh, way to address structural inequality as coming from the system that was responsible for producing the structural inequality. Um, I, I think I could quickly add, 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 try to add to this as well. And, and obviously we are talking about systemic change here as well. And we understand that th these are processes that take, that take, that take time, uh, large bureaucracies and um, complex processes. But, you know, I, I would say over the, over the years, you know, I think we've seen um, the creation of the Indig Indigenous Peoples Platform under the UNFCCC. Um, again, the kind of mobilization of um, the different groups under the kind of uh, the, the band of cl climate justice, which I think is important. Um, if we're looking at um, kind of mainstreaming of gender in, in, into climate change, there's been um, incredible process on that, incredible progress on that front over the years as well. Um, the international negotiations that setting out are, are, are complex to, to maneuver. Um, we have seen, um, I guess, progress coming from outside the negotiations that has had an impact on the negotiations as well. If you consider, for example, the, ocean, the oceans or, and red were not originally part of the internet, international negotiations. And that this came, came about um, through the momentum that was created um, at the, the regional um, dialogues um, as well. I think uh, um, if you're looking at um, kind of access to climate finance now, you know, we see many uh, actors, for example, Save the Children, which are accredited entities and now have um, access to um, financing from the Green Climate Fund among, amongst others as well. Again, there's a lot of, um, I think a lot more that needs to be done in terms of um, kind of data and analytics and, and specifically looking, for example, at the, the access of uh, conflict affected and, and fragile states um, to climate finance and how to, how to close those gaps. So I, I think there's definitely more that we can do um, in terms of the, the evidence base in, in this regard as well. And, and um, we, we do need to take note again um, as mentioned just now, of, of what what is working on on the ground as well. And obviously, that doesn't get as get as much attention as to uh, in some instances, as opposed to kind of what is not. And I think that that definitely does mer merit um, um, further examination. If I can hear one thing that is very common, I think the it's the bottom up approach that um, that needs to be advertised more. And I guess um, there is one question in the Q and A box that uh, Leonardo posed. And he says, uh, linking bottom-up and top-down approaches to climate action in legitimate ways that reduce conflict by contributing to a just transition has been a key theme throughout the talk. Which do you think are the biggest governance challenges in achieving this? How to incrementally or radically transform governance systems towards conflict-sensitive climate action, both in terms of doing no harm and actually contributing to development and peace building. Now, any of you can go. Um, I, I can I can jump in. Um, yeah, it's it's the ideal. I mean, of course, we need things to be locally informed and bottom up, but we also need the the national frameworks and things to be kind of. Um, um, led with national national um, policies and national level um, uh, resourcing things like agricultural policy it does not make sense to, to be done at a bottom up um, uh, community level way because it then needs to be coherence between uh, different regions so that you know one community is not deforesting because they've got a community led uh, forestry program and then of course they're downstream um, uh, neighbors are furious because that's causing uh, siltation of their rivers and um, you know uh, soil erosion. So you do need the national as well as the local um, coming together. Uh, a huge challenge, governance challenge, is that in many countries, in many fragile countries, um, there's really no concept of the state. People don't even identify 
in as, as you know belonging to a particular country in um, in the uh, Lake Chad region, for example, um, in uh, northeastern Nigeria or in uh, the Difa region of Niger, people don't they they don't they don't talk about being from a particular country. They hardly know that they are Nigerian or they're from Niger. They would know their community, but they have absolutely no um, connection with their national government. They have no national identity. They, the, the, the national government or or government governance has has been invisible to them, um, or it's only manifested through kind of uh, through negative channels like the security sector coming in uh, in their efforts to kind of uh, stabilize. Um, um, like uh, terrorist activity, for example, um, often uh, in a very detrimental way to them. So, um, so sometimes, so and a lot of this vulnerability is experienced in places where the state is just not not there. This peripheralization of communities is a really kind of fundamental part of why people are vulnerable because there's no state provision of basic services and um, um, and those kind of social safe safety nets that are part of of uh, local resilience. So one approach i think is um and it's highly problematic is you know more decentralized approaches to governance we're seeing this happen in in a lot of regions but it's also it's it's not the silver bullet i'm sitting in uh, in a decentralized government uh, governed decentrally governed state of of germany and uh it was <laughs> just seeing how the the covid vaccination rollout is going not very well is because it's uh, it's decentralized and these decisions are made at federal level and or, or at not a federal level a state level and it's it's a it's a complete mess. So it's not the solution, but I think that it is part of it. So that you know you're you're um, taking uh, decision making and and uh, financial fi um, resource allocation decisions away from the national government, so it can be more locally informed. Um, the other challenge is that a lot of the climate financing in particular and also just broader development and peace building financing but especially the climate financing it has it, it's the it, it locks in national level like your ndcs are national level you there are some efforts to have local adaptation plans etc but really everything's at the national level the financing uh is is really it's it's impossible for um uh, local actors or even kind of municipalities to access climate finance. So I think that's uh, that's something that needs to be looked at as we see kind of increasingly effective uh, local climate action. If we look at the US, for example, when you couldn't do anything at the national level, you could see state level action uh, really charging ahead. I think uh, the climate finance architecture needs to kind of catch up and enable uh, the disbursement of resources at um, a sub state level. Over. Thanks to Janani's um, point as well. Um, we are also looking at again climate finance um, in conflict affecting a fragile state. So that, as she said, I think that's kind of um, there. There is a gap there, and a lot of that work is in anecdotal. So we do hope, hope to be able to contribute to that as well. And I, I think um, transboundary climate-related security risks are, are are difficult to get to through the kind of typical country office configuration and modalities that, that we have as well. Um, and um, that kind of brings to bear the importance of working with um, regional actors and, and sub-regional actors as well. And that, that I, th I think that's why we're targeting um, and trying to partner with, with such entities on the ground to be able to, to, to get to um, these kind of uh, negative externalities to be able to address them um, and try to think about um, adaptation in, uh, in transboundary and regional contexts too. And if I can just add that um, we're, we're talking a lot about um, kind of states and their ability, whether at a, at a national or a, a regional level, to, to, to manage some of these um, situations. I think that, that it is important to highlight that not all states are the same. And so um, there is a real need to uh, see some of the pitfalls of uh, implementing a, a, a relatively kind of universalized uh, model on something like managing um, particular uh, impacts around uh, climate change, because uh, we know that even within the, the global south, um, where a lot of these these interventions are being implemented, uh, the ability and the um, 
the understanding, the way that people interact with the state, that all of these are quite are quite different and and uh, culturally, socially, politically. Um, the other thing that I that I really did want to want to say was um, that the question asked something about um, about conflict uh, sensitive planning, and I think it's really also important not to kind of um, I'm not trying to like split hairs here, but it, it it is important to not think of of this as either conflict sensitive climate planning or climate sensitive conflict planning. I think the the in 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 some ways. Um, the point is to, to to try and come up with that more um, kind of holistic vision, where where we're we're trying to address um, a number of these 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 uh, structural inequalities through a, a more kind of um, multi-tiered way, and, and and not just as a, a checkbox exercise where uh, yes, you know, this is this is being done in a sensitive way, and, and, and this is being checked as as, as meeting the, the sensitivity requirement. Thank you, Aisha. Um, there was the question about degrowth, which uh, you were, you mentioned before, and uh, Stephen is asking: degrowth is said to be one way to address to the climate emergency. However, it would be difficult to implement a broad degrowth movement without entrenching existing inequalities. Is it necessary for Western countries to abandon current expectations of growth to effectively tackle climate change? If you just want to go ahead with that, Aisha. Um, sure. So I think that um, the the question really uh, needs to be a, like, what kind of growth are we are, are we aiming for? Is it going to be this kind of fossil fuel driven, um, you know, a, a, a increase in GDPs and um, a, a particular model of growth that we know has has resulted in in, in the kind of uh, situation that we are in now, or is this the moment where where we can kind of take a step back and and try and and, and reimagine what um, uh, some kind of of, of well being and, and prosperity could could look like? And um, I don't think that necessarily um, uh, moving forward to um, address some of these issues is necessarily going to result in, um, in in structural inequalities worsening. It's just a question of everything that we've been talking about, looking at it in a in a much more uh, measured and, and nuanced way, and seeing where are the, the vulnerabilities that can be addressed, and and where are the vulnerabilities that are only going to going to get worse. Thank you very much. Um, would anyone like to uh, add a comment to this question? Or we may go ahead with a question by uh, Claudia, who says that considering that climate change, more specifically global warming, has rather likely exacerbated global economic inequality, encompassing 25% rise in population weighted between country inequality over the past half century, and that combined with historical disparities in energy consumption poses a question of what could be done to alleviate the effects or shift the status quo of accumulated robust and substantial declines in economic output in poor hotter countries. Give you a second to read through that question again. Jeff, would you like to go ahead? Well, I, I would say I think it, if if I'm understanding the question correctly, it certainly taps into that um, uh, the previous comments about energy as a neglected uh, uh, realm of of the conversation. Um, but as a as a point of entry, yeah, go back inequality. Yeah, I mean, this gets to the kind of fundamental injustice come from a historical perspective, from a current perspective. There was another question that kind of asked about the, that the, 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 the kind of headline or the top level understanding of a problem caused in the global north felt most acutely by the global south. And that is certainly um, true. And then also additionally, especially now and going forward, uh, a more complex story that has all sorts of ways to 
um, also tease it apart and, and critically important, right? So wealthy high consumers across all countries versus those who are who are poor and not contributing as much, not consuming as much, not. And, and so that um, kind of state to state uh, is one way. Um, wealth of high consum consumers, low consumers is, is another. Um, and I do think that this is one of the ways that there's a recognition and the, uh, words spoken and money promised, but as John Ani says, still kind of almost seen at times as a cost of doing business to get these other um, big picture um, agreements made in terms of um, uh, the kind of common but differentiated responsibilities. How does that translate into actually addressing this, these declines? Um, and these differentials for poor population. So, um, I, yeah, it's, you know, that's kind of one of the biggest questions and gets to why we're including justice in this discussion. Um, there, it's, not a, it's not a short, easy, or clear uh, answer to, to the question. Yeah, and Kizim, I could just add to that as well. I think, um, you know, from, a mitigation perspective from from a perspective of kind of clean technologies it's really important to to kind of remember and to emphasize also that the, the business case and you can see a lot of there's a lot of work out there on that already as well um which shows us very clearly that um a lot of the technical solutions that we needed that we that we need um are already um technically feasible are commercially available um not just high tech, but low, te low, low tech solutions. Um, I already kind of spoke to finance just now, and I think that's that's a critical piece there um, as well in, in terms of addressing um, inequalities, and then also um, incentives, changing changing incentives, the policy incentives as well, subsidies for fossil fuel based systems, and, and so forth. Um, and um, as is the topic of today's discussion, again, the, the kind of governance modalities, how how we how we go about that, and um, I think that's still um, so in some ways a work in progress. It's something that we're, we're working on now as well. Um, there's been, you know, from UNDP side, uh, 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 there's been a lot of work that has been has been done in terms of do no harm um, and conflict sensitivity, but d definitely a lot more that we um, hope to be able to do moving forward. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Janani, would you like to add something? Perfect. Um, okay, there's one more question uh, by Chloe, who asks, um, I was wondering if you could touch upon whether there's a risk, as highlighted by scholars critical of seeing climate change and the environment through security lenses, to depoliticize issues related to conflict and environment and neglect responsibility of bad governments by putting forward the role of climate change instead. Is this a concern that comes into consideration in your work? Um, I, I immediately thought of a couple of examples. So if it's all right, I'll start on this um, on this question. Um, this has actually come up in the case of um, uh, the relationship between uh, drought and the uh, Syrian civil war that the Bashar al-Assad regime has um, considerably kind of um, used the whole climate change was, was the, the, the key feature and, and, and this was the reason why there's been um, a significant degree of, of, of loss of um, various um, food uh, related uh, items and um, very, very actively undermining the role of um, the authoritarian regime and the, uh, the structural uh, issues there. Um, similarly, I, I um, uh, that, that, that was one thing that came to mind. And the second thing that came to mind is um, I was talking about evictions earlier. And this is something that in uh, kind of big urban cities in the global south, uh, I've seen again and again that where uh, land grab, uh, whether it's kind of an organized mafia or whether it's, um, a, you know, a, a slick corporation wants to come in and, um, and, and, and take over land that belongs to um, 
uh, either indigenous people or informal uh, settlers or people who have kind of tenuous uh, land rights. Uh, the, the, the narrative that is often used is this is for flood risk planning or this is for disaster risk planning. And so it really kind of plays into uh, the hands of, of, of those who, who have other ulterior motives uh, to use climate change as the smoke screen through which then um, those uh, uh, agendas can be can be fulfilled. Um, may I jump in, Gizem? Um, I th I think I, I definitely um, uh, agree with Aisha on the on this latter point of, with the the smoke screen that it can be used by. Um, national governments to try and get themselves off the hook, uh, also be be used um, manipulatively by national governments, um, like the government of Rwanda, to really uh, just move people out of very um, uh, valuable land uh, using the, the guise of climate change or maybe disaster risk reduction, uh, even accessing international financing to do this, um, kind of, and then resettling those people and then using the, the land that they've been able to uh, reclaim to go grow crash, cash crops because, you know, the subsistence farmers that were living on those um, high risk areas were not really bringing much to the national economy. So it, that there is certainly that risk. Um, but I don't think that's really uh, a question of using the security lens um, and applying it to climate change. I think this is a risk of, um, you know, climate change being hijacked and used by um, entrepreneurial governments who want to use it for um, nefarious ends or, or, or other actors, um, be it kind of sub-state or mafia. Um, I, there, there is a very broad discussion, a, 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 a very active discussion around the kind of securitization of climate change. And I, I have to say, I, I don't really, understand the concept I, do, I don't I don't see it I don't see it come uh, up outside of academia um, nobody that I'm engaged with um, in kind of uh, in policy work or, or um, operational on the operational side be it um, NATO policy planners US Defense Department stabilization forces on the ground in Mali nobody is is actually on the security side of this is looking to either respond to climate change, to use um, military resources to uh, kind of encroach into climate change, kind of resilience and adaptation measures. Yes, many of them are trying to um, ad address the impacts that climate change will have on their on their assets and their bases, etc. But no, but I mean, everybody on the security side just talks about uh, uh, we're st stretched, we're, we don't have the capacity, you know, that on, uh, say, if you look at the UN um, peacekeeping mission in, 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 uh, in Mali, they're, they're actually tasked with trying to look at climate related security risks, and they're not able to, and they haven't been doing anything on this for a, a couple of years since they've been mandated to do, to do this, because they are just overstretched. So I think, um, yes, there are these kind of hard security risks, um, implications of climate change in terms of um you know the increased risk that it's posing to to already strained relations states citizen relations and intercommunal relations but i think there's a broad acceptance that this is about understanding this in human security terms and that these risks need soft security solutions so, so solutions that really lie firmly in uh, the development and diplomatic um, realms there is a role that the security se can, sector can play around decarbonizing reducing its carbon footprint and also ensuring that its interventions do no harm to climate resilience and increasing inequality um, but I don't really see any evidence I think there was a study by ODI a few years ago to see whether any climate finance had been spent on anything remotely military. I don't think there was a single dollar spent on uh, on um, anything that could be seen as securitized climate aid. Um, and so I think it's not so much about the fear of securitization of climate change. I think it's about promoting the climatization of security policies that we we uh, we could and should be talking about. Can I just respond directly to something, um, if that's if that's all right? Uh, I don't think that when we um, necessarily, I think there's a lot that um, Janani has referred to where, um, where where I would agree, but I would also 
kind of make a, a partial and, and qualified disagreement, which is that I don't necessarily think that when we talk about a, the securitization of a discourse, that we necessarily mean kind of military and guns. Securitization as, as, as a concept just means that it then becomes easier to intervene in a particular area through this very kind of technocratic way. And um, in Whereas, yes, uh, militarily, it, 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 it might be harder to make that link. Securitization of, of, of the climate change discourse, as an example, has made migration quite a, a, a kind of hot subject, right? That climate refugees or climate migrants might come and, and, and kind of try and, and, and encroach borders and create this, um, this kind of situation that needs very active management by particular uh, climate policies. So I know, for example, uh, some years ago, um, the what was then the Foreign Office, but it's now the Foreign and uh, Commonwealth Development Office was really concerned that the largest um, a population of, Banglade of Bangladeshis living outside of Bangladesh is in the UK. So if large parts of Bangladesh were to be underwater, would that mean that the UK would face an exodus of um, of refugees and, 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 and asylum claims from, from Bangladesh. And this was very actively kind of uh, being studied and, and examined to see what were the best uh, policy responses to, to that. So I, I, I just want to say that securitization doesn't necessarily have to be around the kind of military front, but there are a range of ways in which then the state can, 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 can put up these, um, these, these policies and these uh, hard borders. I could quickly um, add, add to that as well, if that's okay, because I, I think, um, yeah, first of all, I, I would agree with um, Janani here as well. I mean, we see kind of increased attention to climate change impacts on peace and security by by um, actors in these sectors as well. So we are talking again about the mainstream of climate change into peace and, uh, and security, and that's the kind of border trend. Um, in, in conflict affected and, 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 and fragile contexts, um, in kind of highly securitized contexts as well, um, Colleagues of mine on the ground frequently talk about the the challenge of being able to prioritize, ensure that ensure that environment and climate change are prioritized in these co contexts, given the um, given the given the um, the urgent humanitarian um, and emergency needs of today as well. So I, I think there is the the challenge there as well. And then then also um, uh, what I, when I think of um, like my recent discussions, for example, with uh, on our work in Somalia. Um, it's, it's not possible to be able to, to, to implement on the ground without close coordination um, and the support of security actors as well. So the kind of, there is better coordination that is, is needed there to be able to deliver um, on climate change um, adaptation and, and, and access to en en energy and so forth. And I think the, the you know, the instrumentalization um, of climate change, instrumentalization of, 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 of other agendas, I, I think if I work on, for example, on PVE, um, being an, an, another agenda that is is uh, an, an agenda that is is um, often uh, faces the challenge of instrumentalization and securitization. Um, th these are obviously important and needs to be um, addressed in terms of kind of good governance um, and and and, and co corruption and and, um, and and so forth as well. I have time for one more on, on this because it's a. a three very interesting interventions to an interesting question. Um, and this may be a heavily uh, kind of US perspective informed, um, but I think uh, one additional consideration and way that at least in the US context, uh, it has been interesting and um, in some cases fruitful for engaging with traditional security institutions is in some ways in the political context that for those um, security actors, uh, a risk approach where there's a lot of priority and a lot of money spent towards uh, a low probability or unknown probability, high negative outcomes is perfectly, that's the way you do business. And so as much as on the climate side where there's been resistance to take real change until we see the absolute manifestations of all the problems that are promised by the scientists, um, then it's like, no, wait, wait, wait. It's, a, it's kind of a cause for delay. And um, in, in that way, the kind of analogous situation, if you wait around for perfectly certain information, right? If you need uh, the perfect IPCC that uh, answers all the questions, which we know will never happen, right? Then bad things happen. And so in that sense, that kind of 
making normal a risk approach that um, means that we have to spend money and do things differently, even when all the pieces of the puzzle aren't in place. I think that's a valuable perspective that um, that can be shared by, uh, at least in some context, uh, an institution that's that's doing it. And so, you know, we're not asking for special treatment. This is what we're doing already. Second, I think there is, again, aligning with a different set of interests and objectives, but there's a greater willingness to see things that we need in that governance and climate response as being prudent, which is flexibility, resilience that goes with, say, um, smaller grids and um, different ways to generate energy and renewable as being a source of resilience that uh, in some, again, maybe a, a US context, if it's good enough for the military given their mission to diversify their energy sources and see renewables as something that makes them stronger, not weaker or distracting or more expensive, then why not the local communities in and around that military base, right? So that kind of demonstration effect of um, that this is actually something that can, these steps can make us more resilient in ways that help us across a, a, a range of challenges um, and kind of integrates climate as opposed to puts it in a separate box by a separate set of actors that is only the climate folks that need to pay attention to it, but understands that it affects all of us and, and it's a responsibility of all of us to respond. And so um, those, that kind of risk analysis and gaming and scenario, as well as that kind of uh, demonstration that this is not penalty, but can actually be empowerment to achieve a wider set of objectives in terms of some of the things we're talking about with um, uh, needed transition can be can be powerful again um, in in certain political contexts. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I'm afraid we're running out of time, and uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for uh, um, for for your interventions, all four of our panelists. Um, if I can quickly sum up, um, I guess one thing that uh, that came out to me as most important here in this discussion is that we need to situate uh, questions of resilience and mitigation within within questions of power, privilege and control. Um, and, and that will have the kind of transformative um, impact that can address these structural inequalities um, and social, social conflict before they become violent. And when climate action or when, when the climate um, question is integrated um, within other uh, political and social dimensions, and, and they're made to understand that uh, there is a big benefit actually of integrating, um, integrating climate, not just uh, as a, yeah, not, not just in the silo, but that everyone benefits from, uh, from, from, these considerations, I guess we will all be better off and in, in, um, in addressing these inequalities. Thank you uh, to the audience for submitting these very interesting questions that were stimulating this uh, discussion. And um, please log on again at 3.30 for uh, our last panel, mitigating the inequality conflict nexus. What is the way forward? Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, indeed. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, everyone. Much. Good conversation. Mm -hmm.